Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 501. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast, a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. For more information or to check out other shows on this network, please go and visit evergreenpodcast.com. I'd like to give a quick shout out and thanks for a five-star review from B. Kiesel on Apple Podcasts. So this week's interview is with Hedy Mardiso. Hedy is the CEO and co-founder, along with my friend Kale Paling, of Cache, that creates smart insurance solutions that take into account your lifestyle and work schedule. Based out of Estonia, Cache is an insurance tech initiative that was voted top 100 most innovative startups in the space in 2021. In this conversation with Hedy, we discuss the notions of platform economy and platform worker, the major problem that Cache solves, the challenges they faced and how they've tackled them, future growth plans, and much more. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com. And please, if you have a moment, go drop in a rating and don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show. Hedy Mardiso, great to have you on the podcast. I, I got to uh, meet you thanks to our mutual friend, uh, your co-founder, Kale Paling. A wonderful man who's also been on my podcast. Uh, in your own words, uh, how, Hedy, how would you like to describe yourself? How would I like to describe myself? Um, I think uh, today I would proudly say I'm an entrepreneur, which is probably uh, something that characterizes a person that is curious, that is self-starter, and is someone that wants to leave a bit of bit of a mark. Right. Well, lovely. Uh, tell us your path to becoming an entrepreneur then, Hedy. Um, my path probably started already early in my school time when I, I, I was always the one that raised the hand to try something or build something or develop something. But uh, the real entrepreneurial activity started um, uh, much later. So uh, my career takes me back to already when I'm I think when I ended uh, my university so I worked full-time for one business software company and which took me around the world I had a absolute um, pleasure in building uh, building uh, marketing activities in South Africa you all over Europe uh, US etc and then uh, I wanted to have a bit of a comet time I worked the uh, nine years in a bank but nine years in a bank was was a good timing to decide that okay this is not me fully. I, I need to uh, do something that I've, I've always dreamt of and uh, and put myself in the position of, of actually becoming an entrepreneur. And uh, that's uh, basically was the same time when we met with uh, Kalle as, as my, my co-founder, who was a bit in a similar journey from politics and wanted to do something else. And basically this is where are very fruitful discussions about future of work and person-centric uh, uh, data and and platform economy and gig economy led led us then to basically come up with a solution how to how to really do then uh, different financial services and and we started from insurance uh, much smarter for for the for the basically flexible workers. So Hedy, what I one of the things I I, I crawled across the web i saw on twitter that you write that you're passionate about developing human centric services tell us about how you came up with that idea with that passion so i think the story goes a bit beyond i, I worked years in a large organization in the banks and 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 uh, and been very inspired by all the work and everything that's done with uh, with gdpr and uh, and I've studied information sciences, so everything connected with data and person, personal kind of, um, and, and what you can do with data has been um, maybe very interesting from, from that on. But how I, I really found the passion when I started to think back, like all the services today, uh, every large organization talks about customer centricity and uh, and how they see their customer and everything. You know, th this is how we define the customer. This is who is the customer, and that's how we look at things. And and then the question is, but if I'm different, 
you know, I'm, I'm, I bring my own example. I had very embarrassing situations when I was, uh, uh, I think, 25, 23, and I needed to buy a dinner to actually Apple, Euro Europe's manager. And I, I sat there with my credit card issued to a student, which looked very studenty and looked a bit silly. So, but, but this one is one just a small example of statistically, you know, I was probably some were normal student and you issued a card. But the same thing happens with insurance and many others that we are all a statistics. But if you take uh, freelancers and people that work flexibly and actually many other, we're not just statistics. We all have our different um, kind of uh, work uh, schedules and logics and models. And I think I think from that on, this, this, this became clear that the future shouldn't look like um, it has been all the century, nine to five everybody's statistics, age group like that. So there has to be something more connected with what we can do with our data. And, and I think this was maybe what, one part of the inspiration. And the other part of the inspiration was, uh, I like to kind of track my sleeps and then my time. And I'm a big fan of Aura Ring, everybody who knows me, and, and uh, probably lots of other people as well out there. But, but basically what it helps all of us who, who track ourselves to understand, you know, there, there's so much more that we don't grasp and see if you, if you take in different IoT data or any other data source, that actually gives a very different picture about um, how you can operate and or how you how you work, how you sleep, how you, you know. And, and I think at one point I started to say that, you know, I'm starting to see a bit kind of three-dimensional picture of myself and lots of things you don't spot if you look, don't look, them, look at them in patterns. And I think this is um, other part of the kind of um, data-driven mindset and thinking that I'm extremely passionate about and 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 we all in cache are so so basically how can we yeah how can we take a, a bit different type of data and make make it more valuable and and provide via that much more personalized and and kind of future oriented services. So what I one of the things I picked up with just what you said, which I really liked, is this idea of identifying patterns from all these this data points. So. The fact that you're based in Estonia, a country I've had the pleasure of visiting several times and understanding to some degree this idea of the digital citizen, the digital connection between every service and industry and government uh, around one ID point, to what extent was that has that been formative for you in the construction of cache and working on data and privacy? Absolutely. Uh, it's definitely uh, very, very kind of, uh, it, it has defined a slot because um, when you, when you have never signed a physical signature while having multiple companies, that's already a very different experience than many others in the world um, have. So um, I think for us, um, on the, the understanding and why I'm saying here very much for us, because, you know, all the Estonian team plus, you know, Kalle comes from politics and, and this was one of the things he did a lot there, everything connected to digitization. So this is for us as a norm that uh, running your own company is not hard. It's actually simple. So from that on, it's 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 very strange to to look how lots of regulators in the world are wanting to regulate platform economy to not make it not, not to regulate the platforms very hardly, not actually try to work hard to make it easier for every person to run their own business and actually be self-employed and, and make that as a as a norm. And I think uh, this is a bit of the mission that we have. And I think uh, well, from cache side, we look very much into the platform workers, but I would say also all Estonians are kind of looking into because it should not be complicated because we have it simple. Then why why are you having it that complicated if you speak with someone from other countries? And I think that definitely has given us kind of um, a bit of a different view into what's possible and what's not. So in one part, there's this idea of normalizing gig economy work where you don't necessarily have to do education and work for a company for 25 years and retire or whatever. But so you're you're trying to validate and make easier this concept. So it's, let's say, maybe disrupting the traditional ideas that a lot of societies have. And the other is this idea of uh, data. And mm -hmm. it, it, it always strikes me as a challenging equilibrium to meet between 
getting the data and rendering a personalized service. It's sort of like the, the horse and the cart, because if I don't have the data, then I can't prove to you I give you personalized service. And what proof are you giving me that personalized service to give me give this trust that's necessary for me to donate to you? And in mm -hmm. Estonia, I think that you guys have obviously created a sufficient level of trust between the citizens and the government for this all to work, including paying taxes. But it's not the same in all the other countries. And so I was wondering to what extent you were trying to export an Estonian, I would say, principle almost, if that's what you would call it, uh, to the other countries when you're running cache. Um, absolutely. Uh, I think what what how we how we look at it is is uh, that uh, running your own business shouldn't be hard. So being working independently shouldn't be hard. It's uh, you know there is there is lots of issues that are not too complicated to fix. So let's all focus on fixing those things, because what what is one of the one of the facts about uh, platform economies like majority of people actually want to work like that. They, they are not forced to work like that. They prefer to work like that because they like to be their own, uh, uh, kind of uh, manage their own time, their own uh, uh, own life. And, and from that on, let's let kind of the philosophy from our side is like, just, let's just make it easy. If we look at the, the services that Estonia has done, we have exported it as a e-residency, which, which is quite, quite kind of a big, big and very innovative solution where basically from all over the world people become uh, can become Estonian e-residents e and run their business and a very simply and use the infrastructure that that we have Excel. So what Cache does then to kind of support and help that is is kind of a bit in a similar mindset and build insurance solutions and that you will you will have the data how you work where you work and and lots of the kind of behavioral aspects that are critical connected with you now not just platforms because one of the things is like in the platform economy there's no whatsoever loyalty so if you are i don't know uber driver or if you are a courier you you work wherever whichever platforms uh, are uh, giving you more money at this sp space of time and the same happens there is multi apping cross uh, cleaners or handyman and, and many others so um, so if if you take this mindset that okay there is time there is people have resources in terms of their skill set or or into into kind of physical labor then they use the time and to earn maximum income and there is today uh, one uh, one ten uh, ten work age person in Europe does already work like that and this is now predicted in a few years to grow one in five so that means there's so many people already doing it today not maybe with full time but part time so the question let's work hard to normalize it and and I think that kind of building the company or or getting that one going is one part of the complexity. But the other part of the complexity and bigger problem are actually exactly the financial services. So, so if you are Uber driver, you need to have a loan, uh, need to have the the kind of uh, insurance for your vehicle. Or if you if you have been working flexibly, you might want to still buy a, buy a house and and take a loan. And today, those two things are often extremely complicated. So, from insurance side, what what when we launched Cache in Estonian market, and I know in most of the other European markets as well the insurance uh, policy for the car of the person that provides also let's say uber or bolt service was um, i don't know three to ten times more expensive and the person could only maybe try a couple of hours so there was a very very different way how people worked and and the, the kind of pricing of the insurance wasn't very fair for them and and this was the initial problem we fixed but we are looking into other things that are really unfair as well like if you take the person that would like to work flexibly but now get a bank loan so you know for the bank they 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 are not often eligible because you know they are they seem to be risky but if you like look often the average person that provides uh, like ride hailing service might earn two times more as a as a nurse or as a teacher it sounds kind of weird but it, it's often the case so then what how come they can't get a loan and the, the nurse or teacher can and that's largely connected with how they work and the trust uh, the kind of bank or financial service provider has 
for that this person will continue working the same way and, and get get uh, and, and be able to pay the loan back. And but if you look at the data that, for example, we have now over the three uh, years have collected, we, we can see clear patterns how people are working. So there it's not ran always random. So so there is so much more light into and so much more kind of tones into this industry to to look deeper. And, and, and that's why we believe that we are in a very interesting mission to really figure out how to how to provide how to enable people to work the way many of them want to. So two things. One is uh, this notion I, I use the word gig economy or gig workers. Uh, you uh, are clearly using the word platform economy, platform workers. Uh, I'd love to find out why that's the case first. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I do. And <laughs> so why why we do that is uh, if you take the kind of European Commission, they did a massive service. And then uh, there was this term was kind of also introduced more widely. And, and I think the reason why we like the word platform worker more is because it kind of combines both uh, the people that do either physical labor uh, via, via getting the tasks uh, via platform, or they do also kind of uh, intellectual labor, because you have lots of people that work as uh, lawyers or programmers or designers that get some the same way the tasks by other platforms. But but also you have lots of people that share their assets, so they don't do their own physical labor, but they earn uh, income via sharing your apartment or via Airbnb, or you you do other types of sharing. Is it uh, I don't know tools, or is it uh, your car, or or many other. So so actually, kind of the the platform worker combines both the the work that you do as a geeks, as a, as really as yourself working, but also the the kind of assets you share and you earn income by other, by those assets. So it's it's also part of the platform economy. Platform economy itself is even wider, but we from Cache has uh, have been kind of taking the focus on both. Because kind of, you know, if I have eight eight hours a day, I can, you know, I'm, I'm kind of managing my portfolio of time. I can share my assets or income. I can share my kind of time in, in doing physical work or, or, or intellectual. It's many, many different ways how you can earn income via digital means. And then I'm I'm sure that if we, if we would do a questionnaire, there's going to be tens of other, other cases. So, so that's why we like to call it not only gig economy and gig gig work, but actually platform economy, because it's also the sharing 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 part is included there. So, if I put my banker hat on, or maybe an insurance executive hat, as I'm listening to you, well, there's no insurance for them. It's there, there's a risk associated somehow. I think that's a perception, and in any event. But it's a precarious livelihood being a gig worker. You don't have a guaranteed salary at the end of the week, much like an entrepreneur for that matter. And and uh, and so I'm thinking that the financiers view that as a risk. How do you combat that perception? Uh, and is it a risk according to the data mm -hmm. you have? Well, data we have quite a bit now because, uh, but, but what we have learned is uh, that's why we like the word pattern every person has their own work pattern so if, if there are there are persons that work let's say 10 hours a week as a in, in a platform economy then they might be working uh, five hours uh, for uber and five hours on bolt and and i don't know some hours on deliveroo they they might work some work um, you can clearly see that it's a university student you know it, it, they, they do some gigs in the morning some gigs in the evening Someone is a pensioner, does more daytime. So, so you can actually find lots of different um, ways how people want to earn additional income. You can clearly see some people doing full-time job and then doing additional jobs on top. So that there are multiple different patterns. What, what, uh, what is visible for them? We don't collect any data that the person won't see themselves as well. So that means that, uh, and what we have noticed that it's, it's almost 80% uh, of the drivers drive with like 60, 70% of the time with a similar pattern, at least what we have seen among our customer base. And, and then you can already start to see that, okay, it's, you know, if you are, have shift work, it's often also very randomized. So there is, so, so there is a, there is a pattern, there is a logic, there is also a different timetable that people, people, uh, prefer to do the work with. So, so from that side, to say to finance, financial people, uh, this is this kind of data they are lacking. 
And that's that's why we believe that we are, are we, that's why we built basically a cache and that's why I believe this is a, one of the important missing elements to really uh, make this uh, these financial services much more kind of uh, fair to all parties, not only to the person, but also to the financial uh, service providers. Yeah, well, I um, want to get into cache itself. Uh, let's start with... How did you come up with that gorgeous name? For for me, it's a wonderful word, having cachet. Um, and and what was the, the arguments for and against it? Because I can imagine it's not just about cash, C A S H. It's not about hiding cachet in French. Um, mm -hmm. What were you What were you thinking about uh, as you put that name together with Calais? Mm -hmm. So uh, it was the year 2018 uh, when we registered uh, our company and, and Caché. So if, if you think back of the time then, then it was the year when uh, besides GDPR being enacted and, uh, and lots of other positive things, it was also a year when there was quite many people that had to leave their homes in Syria and there was a, quite a big migrant wave. So I think one of the inspiration, at least, uh, was for for the kind of trying to, when we when we went to the process of finding the brand and the word was actually dignity, because what we felt uh, why our why our solution what we're building, a person could could maintain their dignity. So you can come from whatever country, go to wherever, and you can actually have your work patterns and and some of the kind of core uh, patterns and scorings with you. So if you come from, I don't know, Syria today, from Ukraine, you know, you go to a strange, a strange country and you, you don't have to be a stranger. You can actually bring that stuff with you. And this is this should be so simple. And this is so simple in today's modern uh, modern society and technical, technical kind of capabilities out there. And basically, um, so we went into the to the kind of web to the thesaurus and started to google around and, and literally from the thesaurus i i found under dignity the word cachet and and when i first saw it it you know i i saw the first kind of meaning of it it's like i approved by a higher authority we verified by someone someone with authority and then uh, you know my own background comes from it so obviously i recognized right away the word cash in it as well which is the mid-memory so for me it was right there oh my god it's brilliant and when I when I went to tell uh, tell about that to Kalla, he was like, you know, there was no discussion. It was it was done. So we we had unfortunately I can't tell you that we had a some sort of big debate about it this this way or that way. We both right away clicked with clicked with the word, and I think this is uh, this is literally what we see still today is our long term vision. We really wanna wanna kind of. Um, uh, make a difference if someone someone needs how would say responsible acting well uh, not doing too much trouble then they should benefit from it and they should benefit and, and have this with us and not just be statistics I, I I've told my story a few times on the stages as well when I, I traveled literally 15 to 20 days a month with my one previous work I was constantly on the road I have thousands of trips and today I'm st and I've never had during that time a single insurance claim for for travel insurance. And today I'm still paying for travel insurance. So I, I should <laughs> I should probably never pay for travel insurance again with all that load that I did with a single claim. And then you think like, uh, but no one cares. No one, no one even notices. No one even knows about it besides me. So why is the world and the the services like that where it's a very obvious digital trace behind? Built so that the the human and the person and their their kind of um, uh, part there doesn't play a very big role. So I think this is this is probably this whole whole journey that we are on and and are looking into a bit changing changing the way. Hopefully this is done. Hey, small business leaders, are you looking for an easier way to onboard and manage remote employees? Or are you feeling you're just doing it all at your company? JustWorks makes it easier for you to start, run, and grow a business. So let me tell you how JustWorks can help your business. I'll give you an example. For anyone who follows my work, you'll know how deeply I believe that great people are at the heart of every business. And JustWorks can help you attract and retain top talent in a competitive market because their platform gives you access to rich benefits usually only available to large corporations, plus a range of health, 
fitness and financial perks, because you and your team deserve them too. And on top of that, the way people are working is changing, and you need human resources tools that can keep up. Whether your team is local, remote, or distributed, JustWorks helps you comply with state payroll tax requirements, keep up with their state labor laws, and access health insurance plans in any state. They also provide proactive support for federal, state, and local employment-related compliance needs. JustWorks makes it simple to hire and manage remote employees across all 50 states of the United States. It's a cloud-based platform that enables managers and employees alike to quickly and securely access benefits, payroll, and other HR functionality from anywhere, anytime. They provide an intuitive, self-service user experience that makes admin easier for the whole team. And they provide help when you need it with 24-7 expert support for you and your employees. By the way, JustWorks believes it's your right as a customer to have a phenomenal service experience every time. It also provides access to certified HR consultants who can provide tailored guidance and best practices around managing your people. With transparent pricing, with no hidden costs, so you always know exactly what you're paying for. You can run your business, therefore, with confidence with JustWorks. So take a look at JustWorks transparent pricing by visiting justworks.com slash pricing. That's justworks.com slash pricing for details. Well, it sounds like the insurance, I can't imagine an insurance broker, an insurance calling me up saying, Mr. Dial, we've noticed that you've been paying us over the years 10 uh, you know premiums and uh you know every year blah 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 and uh well we we can recommend a much cheaper thing that we can sell you ha good luck on that one um so cache glorious name and uh working uh, around this human centric idea and data i was wondering how do you determine uh partner versus customer when you are talking about for example a bolt obviously uh, probably down the road from where you are sitting right now, because they too are an Estonian company or or an Uber or a cleaning service. You have the, the clean the, the the Bolt company, the Bolt drivers, and of course you have other partners, uh, third party suppliers like insurance companies. So how do you organize that human centricity, that or at least the uh, the human centric type of service, and and who's the customer in all that? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a very good question because uh, the, the platform economy is has different kind of uh, faces in a way and different kind of ways of operating. So if, if we look at today how we work with, uh, let's say, Bolt drivers and Uber drivers, and yes, you're right, actually, Bolt, uh, we now moved offices. Bolt is uh, literally 300 or 200 meters from us or even maximum like that. But uh, but uh, uh so today we are selling also often directly to the end end person end customer. So that means the Uber driver or boat driver. So they purchase directly from us, and we start to then aggregate data from Bolt, from Uber, or whichever platform is is operating in the market. So so this is basically how we do it. But we also sell sell differently, where we insure the the kind of platform. And in that case, the platform is then the kind of customer. However, then we operate in B to B to C logic. So we anyway still get the get the data and and uh, and also try to work different technologies to bring the end user, end customer, who is the one insured, to our platform. So um, there, if if you take for example one uh, uh, one of our customer, so they uh, uh, couriers that do you work on Volt platforms, the W, <laughs> one Volt, and a few other platforms. So, um, and our customer there is actually one big uh, cargo bike fleet. So they are renting their cargo bikes to Volt uh, couriers. So they actually, the link is often found on the Volt page. And this comes to our platform where we have the booking solution for them, plus then the insurance. And by that, we make it flexible. We ensure that only the slots that they're active. And obviously, then the cargo bike fleet company, who uh, who is actually our uh, policy holder, is the one that uh, that uh, gives the bikes out. So that means that we have connection with the courier and, and they we, we can insure them also by a slot. So there are different ways we have solved that problem. 
So just now trying to dial in on this notion, I let's say I'm a driver and I have three apps that I use to get my business customers and all that. So I I don't have to worry whether I switch from Bolt to Uber. The insurance happens with me in the car that I'm driving. So that's the unit that you're insuring as opposed to the service that I'm using. So yeah, in, in terms of car insurance, uh, in Europe, yes, it's about the car. It's the car that we insure and your time uh, spent in the car as a taxi versus your time spent in the car as a private person taking their kids to kindergarten. So this time we we are pricing differently. So if you're a taxi, we you are paying a higher coefficient and are fully covered with everything that uh, that could happen. But you also are covered outside in case it's your personal vehicle. You know, it's it's one policy, but kind of dual usage basically. It's that's the simplest way to describe it. So you're always insured, but during the taxi drive with a uh, one type of uh, coverage and with the private time you are as a regular driver. Do you have individuals who, uh, like you were saying about your travel insurance, but individuals who aren't part of necessarily the gig economy, uh, but could benefit from your services as well? Are there any cases of non-giggy gig people who are just, you know, consumers, uh, people living um, mm -hmm. that could benefit from your service? Yep, absolutely. So um, from both cases, we sell also to privates. But the reason for, for that is in case of mo uh, kind of car insurance. So we have both for the private people, but also then for the uh, app taxi drivers. In case of a private, so we also do insurance for, let's say, cleaners or handymen or others. So we want them to be able to buy car insurance from us as well. So obviously they don't need a taxi insurance. So, uh, but uh, I think one of my own personal favorite product that we have is called City Rider. So, and, and this is basically, we also have both ways. So for the regular persons and for the couriers. So it's uh, literally uh, very simple, but very good pro with very good protections and very focused product on people that drive micro vehicles in a city. It doesn't matter if it's a kick scooter or if it's a bicycle, electric bicycle, monowheeler or whatever without a number plate and registration that you drive in the city. And uh, it's cross European. So I'm traveling very much and I don't I'm not the biggest fan of public transportation. <laughs> so I'm constantly on the micro micro vehicle wherever I'm in the Paris, uh, uh, Paris, London, uh, Milan. It doesn't matter. I'm constantly on the kick scooters or everything. And I'm everywhere I'm insured. So, so this is this is in that sense. I don't care if I drive Tier, if I drive Bolt or or Bird or or whatever kick scooter or whichever uh, electric uh, vehicle. I'm always insured. I know that some of them have their own insurances uh, as well, but as a as a person, I I know that I pay one place one time and it's covering throughout Europe. And I have one place if something happens that I can solve it because the complexity of going into dealing with their support lines and trying to get some sort of thing covered is going to be very complex. And that's why this is, for example, my own personal favorite uh, insurance product. But and the same type is then for the couriers that do, uh, do the work professionally. So a bit with a higher coefficient, but it's also they can drive their own car uh, kind of uh, bicycles or sometimes they kick scooters. They're constantly covered. In 2021, I know that Cache was uh, voted uh, top 100 most innovative in the insurance technology space. I was wondering about what your experience is with insurance companies, because on balance, as a punter, a normal person, I have a rather negative opinion about my dealings with insurance, small type, screwing you out of any claims because, oh, you didn't have the 16th uh, amendment uh, properly enforced and therefore you're no longer viable or uh, you know you don't you don't get the the claim what's been your experience working with insurance companies and do you have a very select group or are you trying to work with many so obviously insurance industry is massive and there's very different players out there some of them are extremely sure that they have the only right way of doing insurance and they they want to believe that this will never be disrupted and this will be exactly as is and they don't need to change or they don't need to even think about anything else because that's going to be 
you know, crashing everything down. But then there is a tons of insurers that are fantastically innovative, uh, and they they wanna they wanna figure out solutions with you, and they wanna actually uh, work on uh, building things up. So uh, definitely very different experiences. Um, I'm I can uh, I think the only learning is we'll try to focus on finding the latter and and, and getting uh, getting uh, them uh, them as our partners. So um, the fact is, insurtechs are here. They they are gonna stay as fintechs came. I don't know nine nine eight, nine seven years ago, and uh, they are there. They are mainly to look after how to make insurance much more exactly better for the end, end customer. And I think lots of insurance companies have figured out they need to try to also find ways to work with insurtechs. So I'm I'm maybe not giving you exactly the answer that you want, but I think there is a there is an interesting division. Some are 100% trying to keep the status quo and some are really, really trying to figure out uh, if what would be the future model for them to collaborate with insurtechs uh, to kind of uh, find also out different different ways how to uh, reach the customer smarter. So yeah, so there is there is some some stuff happening <laughs> inside. It's you can't say one or another. Well, this is what I have to say about those old dinosaurs. <laughs> Somehow <laughs> they need to grow up. <laughs> get on, get with the program. So um GDPR, you've mentioned it several times. This is the regulation that essentially overlooks European data protection uh, rights and such. Uh, you have obviously a very inside view, having you know really looked at it a lot. And I'm wondering, on a scale of one to ten, one being I hate it, ten I am totally in love with it. How do you rate GDPR? <laughs> well, if, if you ask me when I worked in a bank, then obviously I, I would tilt more into harder. But but um, <laughs> but if you ask from from a personal and as a as a consumer and also from a cashier perspective i would be more on the how to say 7 to 10 scale obviously there is still lots of ways to go and that there is definitely going to be uh, you know in every regulation there is uh, lots of lobby and lots of um, trying to find a common ground so i think you can never give it to 10 in a, or give it a zero so there is always some sort of common ground but if we look from the things that I, I personally and from cashier perspective, we feel that are great, are, are everything connected with the, the, the overall, the change of the mindset of uh, how a person should be positioned in the overall, overall equation. And, and literally kind of if we take the virtually think that now they should be around the table, they should have more say in who can use, when they can use and, and how their data can be used. Obviously, the, all the cookie policy jokes that we 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 have seen, and the, you know, this this doesn't often make sense. But end of the day, the, the logic that um, then and, and that what I and and Kashe has really kind of, I would say, even even made bigger is, you know, if I I collect some sort of data about you, then the best thing as a company show uh, show it to me as well uh, what kind of data you have collected about me. And this, and and I I should be you know it should be a dialogue not a monologue, you know and and I think when and especially in insurance and everything to do with changing your risks and your behaviors if you see the data that you that you kind of leave behind and start to make the company helps you to make sense of it first of all you become much smarter you, about yourself and uh, potentially about the risks that you are um, uh, kind of. Uh, but putting yourself in and and if you can see those risks then lots of smart people and it's i think in a human nature then they slightly correct them their behavior as well and that's the kind of nice way of nudging you into into really kind of um, uh changing some behavior i always bring a, i like to bring the jokes about myself because i've, I've analyzed it quite a bit on this journey so all my accidents, what I've done in a car, have happened basically in the November evenings when it has been raining. So I'm very happy now. It's December now. I'm sitting on the on the wheel again. But but jokes aside, I think you know, if someone would have pointed it out for me, I I, I looked through myself and my history of uh, then it's it was so obvious. Probably I don't know. It's dark nights in Estonia. It gets very dark very very early and everything like that. So. I just, you know, use both at the time. And I've done that. And I'm now this November, I almost haven't been joining. And no accidents all, all day. Bravo. It makes me think, wouldn't it be amazing 
if you could link your aura sleep uh, to the data around your driving, because for example, uh, every time you sleep only three hours in a night, uh, yeah. you have a 38% chance more of a risk of da, 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 da. I think there, and you know, or if you're, um, the different parts of your month or the different ways, uh, you know, that your heartbeats are uh, higher maybe, or other elements on a physiological level that yeah. could, uh, indicate how to drive safer. Absolutely, um, I 100% I agree, and, and that's why you can achieve a next level of personalization. Because, because you know, end of the day, why why we are big advocates of this kind of win-win-win business models? Because all of us in insurance, and that's why we we in Cashier are super interested in insurance. It's like when you manage to nudge a person to do a right, better decisions about their behavior, while knowing the data and the patterns about themselves then there's a less accidents to happen. And when there are less accidents, that means there are less claims and everybody are happy and potentially also less uh, like uh, really dangerous accidents. So so 100% agreed. Uh, but if you look at today's cars already, uh, the same thing, I'm you know, la laughing that um, my, my car gives me lots of lots of lots of abuse of uh, not being too sleepy or or staying alert and awake so I think this is uh, one thing is aura telling you you know don't go to the behind the wheel when you have been sleeping three hours but today the the cars are really watching your eyes and 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 telling you quite strongly that have a coffee or, or something like that so I think this all actually is is the technology for good and and, and probably saves lots of lives. It reminds me of a story of a friend of mine in Iceland who had uh, shipped in a, a brand new, very, very swank, I think it was a Mercedes or something, and uh, he wanted to show it off to everybody. And uh, they're speaking about it at the dinner party. Look, I got this great new car. They went out to to, to work it, but um, he turned, he got in the car and turned on the key, but it didn't work. He's like, well, bloody hell, I just spent $250,000 on this or whatever it was on, on this beautiful car didn't work yeah i'm really upset and he got very embarrassed and then someone else said well uh, let me let me see if i can work it goes gets in the car and it turns on immediately ah oh phew at least it works turns it off goes out the owner goes back in doesn't work again because it had a breathalyzer attached mm -hmm. to the the wheel <laughs> um to what extent are you using artificial intelligence in cache is there any hidden secrets <laughs> So I think, well, artificial intelligence is a very big word. We all know about that. So obviously we have uh, different learning models, uh, what we use. So um, so uh, one is uh, when, when you issue claims by us. So so we we all we also have the kind of uh, visual, what we learn from the photos uh, when the accidents are. Uh, so when you upload uh, or when you buy a policy, especially when Costco, you actually also upload your photos of the cars and when the accident happened. So they, there we use uh, and, and also when you describe uh, so natural language, visual AI, so those kind of learning models we are we are using. And obviously from our um, our kind of core uh, kind of behavior model that we do connected with them that the world driving there we there we use uh, learning learnings as well machine learning algorithms. So is there a bigger data play then with your cache as in using all of the aggregates, perhaps in driving in certain countries, that's going to help you maybe negotiate with insurance companies and saying, well, how are you looking at the big data play? And is that where the AI is also helping? So, well, if, if you look what was launched during the week and then uh, well, yet yeah, this we don't use. <laughs> so there is there is some really impressive uh, now results coming out. But but obviously everything connected with uh, how to um, how to kind of make those different models uh, in connection with your behavior and, and the kind of potential risks uh, that you might be uh, uh, putting yourself in. So and those kind of feedback loops. Yes, this is this is our core. What, what we really focus on. So our our ultimate ideal position would be that we can give you as good recommendations how to nudge your behaviors or or what what kind of things are affecting something in your in your uh, in your daily activities what could lead into also higher insurance prices at the end of the day so this kind of dialogue that we are building with with uh, with exactly different data analytics and, and ai tools so how many employees do you have today at cache so today we have 22. 22. So we're still a smaller team, but however, now we have been growing actually already quite a bit this year and we'll, we'll continue. 
And, and of course, congratulations on raising five and a half million euros uh, earlier uh, in May 2022. So one of these situations that what, what is the hardest thing for you to think in, in terms where's the where's the bottleneck? Is it getting the Uber drivers? Is it getting attention with the Ubers and Bolts management? Is it getting attention with the insurance companies? Is it where or is it attention retention of application of new employees uh, which that's something so many companies are worried about uh, what uh, what are the big big issues you're trying to uh, tackle right now well i think the biggest is still defining the the good insurance uh, carriers and partners to work with uh, to really launch those um, those solutions that are built on technology, and so what we what we have developed, uh, what really could uh, uh, could could make the the kind of overall policies and insurance covers more flexible and and tailored. Um, so this is this is one of the probably biggest bottleneck really how to get the, the quick uh, partnership in a, in a way that those products are fair and um, and, and and good. But uh, as you said, this year has been, uh, we have been growing. So finding the, the best of the best and, and really the top talent and, and getting them quickly in has been, has been a big, big work that we have been doing this year and, and will continue. So, so definitely both. But, uh, but I think from the platform side, they are very open for this kind of solutions that we are, we are building. So I, I can't, I can't list them as a, as a blocker. It's more still on the insurance um, kind of partnership side that that we are, uh, you know, yeah, that we can see as a bit of a blocker to grow faster. So, in in terms of insurance companies, then are you trying sort of typically to look at pure players, digital only insurance companies, as opposed to institutional big access and whatever type of players? Depends a bit on the product line. So what what Kasha has taken on is well, one of the most complex product to scale is definitely the the regular third party motor liability, which is uh, which is very 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 localized and very local. Every country has uh, their own regulation, their own like rules around it, and uh, for someone to underwrite from the carrier insurance carrier side as well, they need to have lots lots of things com compiled. In the, in the market, so it's not something that I'll take one one partner and do it across Europe. It, no one has done it like that. So um, so in that sense, uh, but from some other product lines, it's much easier to do it. So it's it's a varies a bit, and uh, I think in that sense, uh, insurance uh, uh, in insurance industry as as such, we we work with multi multiple. So both as the more digital players, but also as the larger larger like alliances and and others. So so. It often doesn't. It, it some some somewhere as matters, but often it's you know it depends depends on the market. It depends on the on the product. So who has the appetite? Welcome to Europe. <laughs> yeah. um, with your background in, in and obviously your strength of understanding data, one of the ideas or at least one of the issues as an entrepreneur is figuring out what is the really important indicator of success and i'm wondering if you have a sort of money ball singular data point that really you're looking at maybe nervously or excitedly to help you navigate the business um I think well, I I would love to tell you one one uh, one metric or one concrete thing, uh, um, but uh, since since um, it's it, it's probably hard to only say one. But if I would have to still choose one, is probably uh, uh, overall kind of sign ups to purchase. So how how many people have signed up and purchased uh, something in a one go? Would be something that is probably most most critical important for us, and the second one obviously NPS, so the ones that recommend us. Uh, so net promoter score. Net promoter um, score. Last question for you, Hedy. Um, growth plans. You're, as I understand it from my research, you are in three countries uh, operating directly. Your website has five languages, is and which is quite a huge amount of work. Uh, and that you are operating in a number of other countries uh, with third-party suppliers or contracts. What are the 
growth plans and are you are you thinking beyond europe and uh, or are you looking at just expanding the type of services within europe where are you focusing your attentions so so cache has also a eu broker license so we can well uk sorry <laughs> but uh, but the eu broker license we have so we can sell uh, basically throughout europe which we do in 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 case of B two B to C as deals, so there is so sell everywhere. If we talk about yes direct, we today are in three markets, and yes, we will be scaling now next year to one or two others where we're going to sell directly. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, beyond Europe, and uh, I don't today consider uh, UK beyond Europe in, in terms of <laughs> in terms of that. Uh, but if we're talking about beyond Europe, um, there has been some interesting discussions we have been having from both um, with some uh, potential partners in Asia and some uh, US. But today we don't have uh, yet that confirmed um, concrete timelines uh, in, in place. So we focus our attention purely on, on Europe. Uh, well, it's so uh, important when you're when you're an entrepreneur, time is rare, resources. You, I mean, as much as you've got a great funding, you do need to be strategic about where you go. Yeah. Um, Last question, Hedy, you've become this well-known entrepreneur. You've been identified as a woman to watch in fintech. Uh, what is your most important lesson learned so far as an entrepreneur, which could inspire others to do the same? Um, I'll probably try to summarize it a big, uh, from two, three main steps. You know, first of all, it's a fantastic decision to start your own company. So everybody who has been working in a banks and other large organization for 10 years and, and are scared to jump out, don't be scared. To just do it. You can always go back. So I Amen. think that's one of the one of the lessons learned. It's it's a it's a fantastic feeling. So, so the second is um you know growing and building your team is a one way the most uh, fantastic thing to do, but also one of the hardest. So so um, I think one of the things, um, what I'm super proud and happy, and, and you know, it's very hard to, to, to decide who should be our co-founder or the early employees. So one, one decision I, I made, made early on was that I'll, I'll choose it based on values and how, how we with Galla clicked was, uh, we didn't know each other for, I don't know, 20 years, we, we knew each other less. But one thing that uh, I felt and he felt was that we, you know, whatever we know will have fights, everything. But we know that at the end of the day, we, we share similar values on, on a background. It's starting from, you know, but, so from multiple different places. And, and I think this one has been a very good North Star to when you need to select someone to, to your business with. And, um, and the third thing I would say is... Um, Building a startup is hard, so give yourself a break as well. And it, it's okay. I'm, I'm a perfectionist as well in my my kind of. And I think what I've learned is uh, it always goes with some sort of growth stages. And it's good to relook. One thing is your whole agenda every quarter or every half year, but at the same time, like relook how you lead, how you manage, and and just kind of rethink um, with like quarterly or or half every half year. A bit of your the ways of doing. If you already have big enough team, you 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 need to step on a different different position. And I think those are probably my kind of maybe three things to to list out because because it's it's so so rewarding to kind of understand that yes now now I can move move to a different kind of way of doing things and it gives you the understanding that yes your company is growing you your, you yourself are growing. And and I think this is this is the fun of being an entrepreneur. So to recap, uh, have fun, just do it. Uh, the second was make sure that you choose your partner co-founders uh, according to values and North Star. And the third was give yourself a break and uh, maybe fly at thirty six thousand feet to see where you are every thirty six, you know, every six months or whatever, in order to make sure that you are taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Hedy, many, many thanks. Uh, give a big shout out and hug to Kale and uh, carry on with Cache, eh? Will do. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having listened to this episode of the Minter Dialogue podcast. If you like the show and would like to support me, please consider a donation on patreon.com forward slash Minter Dial. You can also subscribe on your favorite podcast service. And as ever, Rating and reviews are the real currency for podcasts. 
You'll find the show notes with over 2,000 and more blog posts on mentordial.com. Check out my documentary film and four books, including my last one, You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. A stranger tucked around me, precipitating the danger to feel free. Trust is a reason, still, I won't tell the lie. I sit here passively, hope for your respect, anticipating the thrill of your intellect. Maybe I tell myself there's no use in me lying. I'm a convinced man building an urge. I'm a convinced man to live and die submerged. A convinced man in the arms of a woman. I'm a convinced man challenge my fate. I'm a convinced man competitions in me. A convinced man in the arms. Of a woman Despite revenges and struggle with deceit Live for the challenge so life's not incomplete What's wrong with challenge? I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me Precipitating the danger to feel free Trust in my reason and let me show you why I'm a convinced man practicing my lines I'm a convinced man here in these confines A convinced man in the arms of a woman I'm a convinced man me to the test. I'm a convinced man. I'm ready for an arrest. I'm a convinced man in the arms of a woman. Of news about LinkedIn, Indeed, Google, and just about every other recruitment tech company out there? Hell yeah. 
I'm Chad. I'm Cheese. We're the Chad and Cheese Podcast. All the latest recruiting news and insights are on our show. Dripping in snark and attitude. Subscribe today wherever you listen to your podcasts. We We out. out.